Welcome back to our Shepherd. Great to see all of you, and I can see that you're smiling. <laughs> You've all got smiling eyes. This is the day that the Holy Spirit comes to the church, the day of Pentecost, and so how fitting it is that we all, by God's grace, return, led by His Spirit, and now receiving the gifts of the Spirit in His Word and in His sacrament. I can tell you from personal experience, receiving uh, the body and blood of Christ for the first time after three months is a, is a very moving experience, and it will be glorious for all of us to be there up front. It's going to be a lot different from what we've typically experienced, but not as far as God is concerned. You will receive the forgiveness of sins and grace for everyday life. Now, for those of you who are watching at home, yes, there's several people here. It's wonderful, uh, but if there's zero pressure to come, I know I'm looking at the camera here. You can stay home as long as you like for any reason that you like. Whenever you feel comfortable to return again, you'll be welcome with open arms. And we look forward to that. And there is a time for people to receive Holy Communion today from 1 to 3 o'clock. For those of you not ready to gather together in larger groups, but still wanting to receive the sacrament, come between 1 and 3 today. And you will, you will be able to receive uh, in a very safe environment. So our policy is for everyone to wear masks, and you're all doing a great job of wearing a mask. If we see anyone not wearing a mask, we'll automatically assume that there's a health reason that you can't do that, and that's perfectly fine. We ask that when you come up to communion as well, you'll, you'll wear a mask. Uh, well, I'll get, to, I'll get into more details on that later on. We don't need to burden you with all that information at this very moment. Now, during the offering, you're gonna see Pastor Gartner and I, the worship assistants, leave the church. We're going to wash our hands for at least 20 seconds. We might even go to 30 seconds so that you'll see we're not wearing gloves as we serve Holy Communion. Uh, but we have, we'll have freshly washed hands. And if there is any incidental contact between hands during Communion, we have a bottle of hand sanitizer there to, to take care of that. And finally, when you're departing today, you see we've marked uh, arrows for ingress and egress. But really, as we rethink that a little bit, it's much better to have more room than less. So please ignore the arrows on your way out and just go ahead and walk in any way that you would like. I think that's all that we need to know for now. Let's now rise and begin our worship together in person in the name of Jesus Christ.
the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please kneel or be seated. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins as a called and ordained servant of the Lord and by his grace alone, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful. Hallelujah. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. These all look to you. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you send forth your spirit, they are created. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful. Hallelujah. O Lord, O Christ, O Lord, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, on this day you once taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us in our day by that same Spirit to have a right understanding in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy consolation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Heavenly Father speaks to us this morning, first in the book of Numbers, chapter 11. Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the Spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading from the book of Acts, the story of Pentecost. 
When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the seventh chapter. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
may be seated. That was a tough hymn. <laughs> when uh, Todd and I were picking the hymns about a month ago, we were anticipating we'd have a choir and we'd be open again. I think we have to rethink that hymn without a choir. It is a joy to have you here. The children's message is somewhat from a distance uh, because many of the kids are still um, participating in the live stream. But you can help me today with this. The day of Pentecost, and hand motions to help us kind of think about what happened on the day of Pentecost. I'm so, there we go. Um, so something like a mighty rushing wind. Normally I would say let's all blow really hard and make a big sound of a mighty rushing wind. I think that's maybe a bad idea today. So with our hands, what would a mighty rushing wind look like? So all right, so you got the mighty rushing wind. Okay, good mighty rushing wind. All right, now tongues of fire. Fortunately, because we don't blow like dragons, smoke, and fire, we can just use our hands for this one much easier than the wind was. But what would you do for your hand motions for the tongues of fire? Maybe something like this. Oh, I saw Joe. Show me your hand. Yeah, Joe is like this, the tongues of fire. I feel like that's jazz. Um, all right, so the disciples on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Easter, they're all uh, together, and this sound like mighty rushing wind arrives. The tongues of fire lands on them, and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The church receives a gift, the gift of the Spirit. But this is the key thing I want you to remember from this children's message, that all of the mighty rushing wind and the tongues of fire, this gift of the Spirit, it was for the church to be able to go out. So we got one more hand motion to add now. What would go out look like? So, we got that. That's a good one. Maybe, oh, Barb's like, go. Like, what are you still here for? Go out. I like that. Uh, or, last night I had uh, one of the boys here who was doing feet on a hand. Go out. Because you see, the gift of the Holy Spirit is to equip us, to give us the skills, the, the power of God to be able to go out. To be able to go out into this world and to share the good news in a language that people can understand. That's what they did on the day of Pentecost, and that is still what the church does with the gift of the Spirit. The gift of the Spirit has always been a gift, not just for ourselves, but to send us out. I give thanks for that gift among you and among all the little children uh, that are also proclaiming the good news. Let's uh, say a word of prayer now. Repeat the words after me. Dear Jesus, Thank you for your love. Send the Spirit upon me that I would go out into the world to share this good news. Congregation, now please stand as we prepare to hear the good news of the sermon. The text for today's proclamation of the good news is from John chapter 7. On that last day of the feast, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up. And we want to hear about why he stood up and what he said. So he, here's what he says. If anyone thirsts, let him come out to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. You may be seated. I want to start the sermon with just sharing with you a point of irony, uh, a fun little detail, that it's the Feast of Pentecost, and the Gospel lesson is not about the Feast of Pentecost. I find that funny. It's a little personal liturgical joke, I guess, on the person who designed the lectionary, this selection of readings that we have for every week. But there are three great festivals in the Old Testament that would cause people to take a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. There is the Feast of Passover, there is the Feast of Pentecost, and there is also the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Booths, Feast of Tabernacles, I'm just going to call it Feast of Booths right now, this was a feast to remember how the Lord had provided them shelter and protection and all that they needed while they were in the wilderness. So think of booths as shelter, but also that word tabernacle as a place of holy dwelling. 
because God had provided for them the tent of meeting when they were in the wilderness. So after they leave Egypt, they cross the Red Sea, and they're in the wilderness, they thought they were alone. But they were not alone. The Spirit was guiding them by day and by night. The Lord was providing them a tent of meeting, a tabernacle, where they knew the presence of God was with them. They were receiving daily the provisioning of God through the manna and the quail. And when they were thirsty, the Lord would provide water from the rocks and the bitter water would be made sweet. This Feast of Booths was a feast to remember the promised presence of God that would provide for them what they needed during their time of wilderness. This great feast had a series of rituals that were a part of it during the time of Jesus. On the last day of the feast, a priest would take a golden pitcher and he would go fill waters from the Pool of Siloam and then there would be musicians, there'd be this parade. And they would move from that pool to the temple. And then he would pour that water from the Pool of Siloam out into a bowl by the altar. And it was a reminder for the people of the flowing river of the Spirit. This was, as I prepared for the sermon, I have to let you know, I kind of, I, I know about the, the mighty rushing wind. I know the, the dove and the tongues of fire I've got on my stole. But the river being a symbol for the Spirit of God was something I had not seen before in Scripture. But when I started looking for it, I was like, it's there. And this is a, a feast where they would pour this water in anticipation of the Spirit arriving. They would remember how in the book of Ezekiel, back in Ezekiel chapter 47, as Ezekiel is being guided by a vision of the new temple, as the temple is being built and he's being shown the north, the south, east, and west of the temple, he sees that the rivers and the waters are rising. In the book of Revelation, we see this. In Revelation chapter 22, it describes the new heaven and the new earth, and the river will flow from the throne of God and from the Lamb. When John gave them that image in Revelation 22, as they were sending this letter out to the world to let them have confidence during a time of persecution, that God was with them, and that God was going to continue to, in his presence, provide promise and provision that they needed, this image of a river flowing from the throne of God to the people, it was filled with the promise that the Spirit was going to be enlivening the people. And then he adds in Revelation that on the shores of this river is the tree of life, and it has fruit for every month. It never goes out of season. Psalm 46 says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The river was the confidence that the Spirit was with them. But now as I hear this imagery of this water flowing, this river arriving from the pool to the temple, when Jesus stands up on that last day, that great day of the feast, and offers himself and says, anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink, he is offering himself as an expansion of where that spirit can be found. At the feast, they are seeing that water flowing from the very specific place at the temple. And that is a foreshadowing of the presence of God, the temple, the sacred presence of God being among the people and that river flowing from the temple to the people. The feast was always pointing ahead, always getting the people ready for how God was going to send his spirit to the people and then it would flow to the people. When Jesus stands up on the last day, the great day of the feast, as this great parade with the musicians and this water and these pitchers and bowls and this water at the temple, and he says, anyone who is thirsty, come to me. He is showing everyone what that feast was supposed to be pointing to has arrived. The not yet moment of anticipating how the Spirit was going to be among them had was over. The not yetness was done. The fullness of the promises of God was arriving amidst the people. This is one of the promises of Jesus in the flesh. 
that the not yetness, the it hasn't arrived yet, we don't get to experience it yet, that feeling of hope deferred is over. Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, the salvation of God has arrived. All of that is there when Jesus is standing in the crowd and says, what that is pointing to is right here. Anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink, and you will be satisfied. And in case we thought that he's kind of weird and he's talking about anyone who's thirsty, it is the last day of the feast. We didn't bring enough water bottles with us. We've been waiting for this parade. The parade's been late and started. He says, whoever believes in me, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow this living water. And with that next statement, he expands even more where the fullness of the Spirit has come. He didn't say, anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink, to say it's now at the temple, now it's at me, and it's this very localized, very geographically small spot. Before it was at that small spot of the temple, now it's at the small spot of where I'm standing. No, he's standing up to say, it's here. Wherever you believe in God and trust He is at work through you, the Spirit is flowing. The Spirit's not just at some pilgrimage spot that we go there and we see it flowing and then we go somewhere else and it's empty in the world again. With the arrival of Jesus, the Spirit is coming to flow in the world. And so this is giving me, it's giving me this confidence that when I am looking for the working of God in this world, I'm not looking for it in just some small geographical spots. I'm so glad you're in the sanctuary today with me. For those who are at home, I'm glad you're watching with me. But I want you to have confidence that the Spirit that has been promised by Jesus has not arrived to be in just micro-dot moments around the world. It's come in the promise of God to change and transform this world. With the Spirit was not just the audio-visual display of the mighty rushing wind or the tongues of fire, although in the children's message you did provide a very good display. The Spirit came to equip the church to go out into the world to proclaim the good news of God. The Spirit arrives to make glad the city of God. The Spirit arrives to bring the working of God into the world. When we want to see the working of God, we don't just go on some pilgrimage to some micro moment. When we want to see the working of God, we see it in His Word. When we want to see the working of God, we see it in His sacrament. When we see the working of God, we see it in the flowing waters of baptism. When we see the working of God, we see righteousness. We see justice. Another passage from the Bible that speaks about the waters of the Spirit arriving is from Amos chapter 5. And Amos chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, start with Amos' frustration that the people have filled their time with empty celebrations and just a bunch of noise and have forgotten what the celebration was always supposed to be pointing to. Amos says, I hate your empty feasts. Take away the noise of your songs, but let the justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Which is more important for God, empty celebrations and noisy songs or the righteousness and justice of God flowing into this world. I think Amos makes it really clear. God would much more have justice rolling down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, much more than he would noisy celebrations, especially when they're empty. I want to tell you that the first time that I heard those words of justice rolling down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. I did not realize it was in the Bible. I remember seeing it at one of those uh, grade school Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebrations and remembrances and hearing the I Have a Dream speech and hearing Martin Luther King Jr. saying, no, no, we are not satisfied 
and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. He was speaking of unfulfilled longings, of a deep desire for hope to no longer be deferred. And as I look at Amos, I see that's exactly what Amos is asking the people to do as well. To no longer just see the promise of the Spirit be something that's deferred and a not yet and someday, but to see that everything that those celebrations have been pointing to has arrived. And that it is time for the church to go to Jesus and drink from the waters of life. And it's time for everyone who believes in him to see that spirit from us flowing like an ever-flowing stream from us. This Feast of Booths, this last day, this great day of the feast when Jesus stood up, was promising the spirit. And now on the Feast of Pentecost Church, that promise is now not just for that moment when Jesus stood up at that middle of that parade. That promise the spirit has arrived. It has arrived on that day of Pentecost. It continues to arrive in your baptism. It continues to arrive through this word. As Roman 10 reminds us, faith comes by hearing. It continues to arrive as we bring that river of life flowing in our own lives. As we let the justice of God roll down like waters from us. As we let the righteousness of God flow from us. Amos had pointed to an empty celebration when people are crying out for the presence of God, when people are crying out for the promise of God, when people are crying out for the provisions of God. And all of that is going to come in its fullness on the last day when the trumpet blasts and the new heaven and the new earth are there and the river of life from Revelation 22 is going to flow from the throne of God and from the Lamb. All of that is going to come in its fullness. But it's not just that. I believe that river of life that's in the new heaven and the new earth being described in Revelation, it's not just a someday hope deferred for the church. It's a part of how the church is right now supposed to be the church, to be the reality of the new heaven and the new earth. By faith, I believe it's going to be full. By faith, I believe that promise is going to flow in full, rushing waters of the Spirit. But I think that faith that I have is not supposed to be just a faith of someday. It's supposed to be a faith that says right now that's happening. Right now the Spirit's arriving. Right now, Emmanuel, Jesus, Pentecost, all these words are letting me know that Jesus is the source, the life, the way that this justice and righteousness is going to happen. I feel, though, that the sermon has been filled with a lot of metaphor, a lot of river, a lot of flowing, a lot of someday-ness. I want to read for you from Job chapter 29. In Job, I want to give you this image then of how Job describes the river flowing for him. And he's describing how that spirit is at work among him. So from Job chapter 29, verses 12 and forward. I think this is more concrete than the word river. I delivered the poor who cried for help, the fatherless who had none to help them. The blessing of him who was about to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy, and I searched out the cause of him whom I did not know. He was putting on righteousness. He was wearing the clothing of righteousness. And it wasn't a metaphor of a river. It was helping the cry of the needy being answered. It was helping those who were struggling. I long for this clothing of righteousness. I long for this justice to be worn by the church in the world today. Because we are living in a time when injustice and unrighteousness is becoming the norm. And I know people keep talking about the new normal, but one thing I don't want to become normal is injustice. One thing I don't want to become something we get yet used to is unrighteousness. I want the church to be able to stand up like Jesus did. When Jesus stood up, everyone was going someplace hoping that someday something would happen. And Jesus stood up and said, everyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. 
and everyone who believes in me will flow like a rivering water. Spirit of God, come now. Guide us in this truth today. Give this church the wisdom to stand up to those who are thirsty and longing for hope. Church, it's time we stand up. And say, everyone who's thirsty, come to Jesus. He is the righteousness. He is the justice. He is the cry of the needy being answered. May this be the confidence, the courage, for the church to be the just not the not yet and the hope deferred, but the now and the hope that's answered. Amen. Will you please stand? Almighty God, let that spirit flow through us. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. May that river flow from your altars, flow through us, and carry us out into this world. Let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Amen. We now continue our service with this opportunity we have to confess our faith words with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Almighty God, you have blessed us in love with the Savior in whom is forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Grant to us your Holy Spirit, the Comforter whom you have promised, that we and all who call upon his name shall be saved. Help us to treasure in our hearts your mercy and to give ourselves fully to your service. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, Christ was planted in death for our sins and raised for our justification, and in him shall all the nations of the earth be united. Give us pastors who will preach this word made flesh faithfully and church workers who are devoted to your service. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Almighty God, you have promised the thirsty will drink and from the empty will flow forth rivers of living water. Help us to show forth in holy lives the fruits of the Spirit that justice and righteousness flow like rolling waters, like an ever-flowing stream. Give us a servant's heart that doesn't seek our own way, but walks on the path of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Almighty God, you have promised to make one people from the many. Take from us all pride, prejudice, and hate, that we may not hinder the cause of the gospel by our shame, but give welcome to all people in the name of Christ where we pray special blessings and unification for all those in Minnesota who are struggling now with division and violence. Bless them, Lord, and bring your peace upon them. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Almighty God, we thank and praise you that some are able to gather again bodily around your word and sacraments. 
We pray you would put an end to this pandemic so all your people may be together again and the communities of the world may return to common life. Bless and protect all those who are providing care and assistance to the afflicted. Give us compassion for our neighbors and opportunities to serve. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you carry the burdens of our lives in your hands. Deliver from illness and suffering all who cry to you for release. Hear us on behalf of the sick, the dying, and those who mourn. We hold up to you today, especially Lord Amy Albrecht and her family as they grieve her father's death. As well, Lord, the family of Ronald Reese, who was called home this past Sunday. Lord, we pray for, for, for you to guide the hands of the surgeons who will minister to Ray Sherbarth and El Wanafried this week. We pray for all those, Lord, who are listed in our prayer folder and those whom we name now within our hearts. Answer your people, O Lord, and deliver them from their infirmities and their grief by your grace. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, your word endures forever. Give us grace so that we may be united in doctrine and in the fellowship of your table, confessing Christ boldly and living together in faith and love until our Lord returns in his glory to bring all things to their appointed completion when we will dwell in his house forever. We pray all these things in the name of the one who saves us, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. And just a few announcements about how communion will work before Pastor Garrett and I go off to wash our hands. Uh, first of all, we'll leave our masks on until, until the point right before you'll receive the body and blood of Christ. And we'll start with the lectern side. So folks, you'll go the opposite direction from what you're used to. The ushers will dismiss you towards the stained glass and you'll come up the stained glass into the baptistry. And that's about the right time then to, to remove your mask to be ready to receive the body and blood of Christ. And you'll come to this first station here where I'll give you the host. Uh, we'll have the, uh, the uh, gluten-free host available as well, if you'd like that. And then you'll move to this black table here where Pastor Gertner will have the trays for the individual cups. And we have this wonderful gizmo here that Terry Hines has created. It's a lid that prevents uh, uh, exposure of all the cups at once. So it's picture a pie plate with a wedge cut out of it. And Pastor Gearden will make sure that he's presenting cups that are available to you when you arrive. On the inner rim all the way around will be the, the uh, uh, diluted cups if you'd like to have that instead. And then after you're done, lectern side, you'll walk out uh, this side here behind the pulpit. There's a tray there to place your cups. You'll come back around, and the pastor's going to model this for you. You'll come back around the very front of the pulpit and back down the center aisle and back to your, back to your pew. Now, once we're done with the lectern side, and the pastor will sit down. Perfect. Now, once we're done with the lectern side, the pulpit side, it'll be your turn. You'll move towards the center aisle the, as the ushers dismiss you. You'll go to the back, around the back to the stained glass, and then follow the same path and the same instructions that I've just given for the lectern side as well. When you're done and you drop your cup off, just continue down that side aisle and go back into your pew and say prayers of thanksgiving that we once again be able to, uh, have been able to receive the sacrament together. And just a, another reminder for people who are watching now at home, from one to three o'clock today, we are going to provide communion for those who would like to receive it. So please, just come and arrive and sit in a, in a place that's, uh, you'll see the pews that are marked for places to sit, and uh, we'll invite you forward to receive communion. All right, that's it for now. I'm go wash my hands, and we'll see you in a moment.
The Lord be with you. And also Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who ascended above the heavens and sitting at your right hand, poured out on this day the promised Holy Spirit on his chosen disciples. For all this, the whole earth rejoices with exceeding joy. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the new testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Go in his peace and his joy. Amen. Amen. We pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep, keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage that on the day of his coming we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. People of God, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.